Next, we have Jenny Malloy. Um, Jenny is a researcher um, researching mosquito genetic control uh, for a doctorate at the University of Oxford. Now, she also uh, manages content mine in the copious amounts of free time I'm sure she has. Uh, she also coordinates the University of Cambridge Synthetic Biology Strategic Research Initiative, Open Plan, and the Open Knowledge Open Science Working Group. When do you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Well, actually, so I've now moved from the, so my, my doctorate is finished. So I, so I can strike the University of Oxford off the list. <laughs> so yes, I'm a molecular biologist by training, uh, now working as a project coordinator in the space of open technologies, on one hand for text and data mining with content mine, and on the other for um, synthetic biology and biotechnology at the University of Cambridge. So what I'm not speaking about today um, are things like open hardware for science, um, open material transfer agreements, and a whole bunch of stuff around non-digital um, resources that we require in science. So if you are interested in those, you can come and talk to me later. What I am talking about today is copyright reform. Um, so Content Mine is a project that seeks to extract facts from the scientific literature. And really what we're aiming to do is put the technologies and the permissions for doing that in the hands of researchers. And so we have um, a saying, the right to read is the right to mine. So if as a researcher you have the lawful access to a, to a publication, to any content, and obviously we would like that to increase through open access, um, you should also have the right to mine it, to use machines, to read the literature for you, and to use all of these wonderful technologies that we have accessible to us in the 21st century and not be stuck back reading things by eye manually and transcribing stuff into Excel, as I'm sure many of us who are scientists have had to do. So copyright reform is not perhaps the most interesting of topics for the majority of researchers. And one of the problems with this is that it's ridiculously complicated. So many of us have a general perception of what copyright entails, but the laws are different in each country. Today I'm going to be focusing specifically on a reform that happened in the UK. Um, but I'll just give you a, a quick illustration of one example. It's unrelated to mining, but I think it illustrates the complexity of, of copyright law and the way that it's evolved over the history of, of that, those kind of laws being enacted. So the, the first copyright law was the Statute of Anne in 1710. And it's actually described as an act for the encouragement of learning. Now, you can reflect on what copyright means to us today and decide for yourselves if you think that's an accurate reflection of where we've ended up. So Charles Darwin is a personal hero of mine as a, a molecular and evolutionary biologist. Um, with, and so he died 133 years ago in 1882. The Origin of the Species was published in 1859. And at the time, copyright was 42 years in length. The original Statute of Anne was 14 years, they increased it, um, or life of the author plus seven years. It's now in most jurisdictions, life of the author, plus 50 to 70 years. So, you know, there's been some changes since then. Now, Darwin's Origin and Species and his other published works during his lifetime have been available public domain for quite a while now. And I'm sure many of us with a biological background have dug into those at some point. They are key texts. Um, <laughs> but his notebooks were never published during his lifetime. I got very excited to notice that the University of Cambridge Library had digitised those texts. And then I noticed that they were not openly available. And I was quite disappointed. I thought, oh, well, that's really cool, but also not cool. Um, and I thought, why is that? And knowing the University Library, I thought, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try and find out because I'm sure they would have wanted knowledge to be available. Now, the reason is because they were posthumously published after Darwin's death. And the UK Copyright Act says that anything posthumously published before the 1998, 1988 Copyright Act, when the author was dead for 50 years, has 50 years of copyright from publication. But if it was published after the 1988 Act and the author was dead for over 50 years, or now 70 years because they changed the law, copyright expires in 2039. Now, how we got to 2039, I have absolutely no idea. But that's just an illustration of how arbitrary and complex some aspects of copyright law are and why it's completely mind-bending to try and baffle your way through what you are allowed to do with some things. So, why do we care about copyright um, when we're talking about text and data mining? Well, in order for a machine to read the literature, it requires a copy of that text or data. So we do need to make copies, therefore copyright comes into play. We really, really, really need machines. 
There are 1.5 million papers published per year. I think that's a fairly conservative estimate. And researchers are spending vast amounts of their very valuable time in, in, in reading these papers. So one group that we, we spoke to had a postdoc who was assigned to read 30,000 papers over the course of 12 to 18 months. That's one paper every five minutes, manually, in order to work out if they were relevant for their systematic review. In the UK, there was a, a copyright reform that was um, enacted, a, a consultation that happened in 2011, which required responses in 2012. Um, the responses that one of the proposals raised was to introduce a copyright exception for text and data mining. The responses overwhelmingly supported this from a civil society and research organisation perspective, um, but there were reservations from many copyright holders and, and publishers. Um, Luckily for us, the legislation passed in 2014. So in the UK, it's now become the second country, although there are some other countries with kind of similar laws, to have a full exception for text and data mining for non-commercial purposes. Uh, the other country being Japan. So that is, I think, an epic win. In the UK, we are now free to do all this work, to save ourselves time, to go out and not spend um, days just reading papers and manually transcribing information. We can use a computer. But there are three reasons why it's not an epic win, and I, there's a sign at the back, so I'm going I'm to roll it on. First of all, science is global. The UK is, is not the be-all and end-all. Only researchers in the UK can use this exception. We need it elsewhere as well. Um, a key thing to remember is that although in many countries copyright has fair use, so like in the US, text and data mining would probably fall under fair use, there are contracts with publishers that are also preventing you using that information from libraries. Many publishers have it written into their contract that you're not allowed to use automated machines to index, search, and read the literature. So bear that in mind. Um, number two, it was a non-commercial exception. So much valuable science is done with a commercial connection. And, we, and it's so complicated to try and work out what classes is non-commercial and commercial. There's a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's still a barrier. In 18 months since the UK legislation was passed, we haven't seen a massive amount of action towards greater text and data mining activity within the research community because there are other barriers. We haven't been allowed to do this before. So inevitably, there's a lack of training, there's a lack of knowledge, and that also needs to be addressed. So my, my message is copyright reform, unfortunately, does matter to us. And as scientists, although we have less time and money than the publishers do to go out there and advocate for reform, we do need to get, in, we do need to get involved, particularly those of us who are spending our days manually filling in um, CSV files and Excel tables. Um, and so I would encourage you to go, especially in the EU now, it's a key time for these, seeing these reforms passed at an EU level. Um, and there are many people in the room who you can talk to about perhaps getting involved in that. So it's a, it's a yay <laughs> for copyright reform. It was an epic win, but we need more. And so this is also a call to action. Thank you.